Today we celebrate the 28th Sunday in Ordinary Time. The parish bulletin found at the entrances and on our webpage gives the readings and responses for Mass. Congregational singing is currently suspended as part of our COVID protocols. The celebrant of this Mass is Father Jubel. Let us stand and begin. Sine quitatus observa veris domine, domine quisus tinebit, quia puta propitia. De profundis clamavi a te domine, domine exodivi voce meam. Sine quitatas observa veris domine. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And with your spirit. My brothers and sisters, we gather this beautiful fall day, commemorate and celebrate the 28th Sunday of the church year. Let us begin, as always, by pausing at the beginning of Mass to acknowledge our sins, so as to prepare ourselves to celebrate the sacred mystery. I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done and in what I have failed to do, through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore, I ask, Blessed Mary, ever Virgin, all the angels and saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Gloria in excelsis Deo, et in terra pax omnibus, bone voluntatis, la domus te, benedicimus te, adoramus te, Glorificamus te, gratias agimus tibi, propter maniam gloriam tuam. Domine Deus rex celestis, Deus pater omnipotens, Domine Fili Unigenite, Jesu Christe, 
Let us pray. May your grace, O Lord, we pray at all times, go before us and follow after, and make us always determined to carry out good works. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will provide for all peoples a feast of rich food and choice wines, juicy rich food and pure choice wines. On this mountain, he will destroy the veil that veils all peoples, the web that is woven over all nations. He will destroy death forever. The Lord God will wipe away the tears from every face. The reproach of his people he will remove from the whole earth, for the Lord has spoken. On that day it will be said, Behold our God, to whom we looked to save us. This is the Lord for whom we looked. Let us rejoice and be glad that he has saved us. For the hand of the Lord will rest on this mountain. The word of the Lord. A reading 
from the letter of St. Paul to the Philippians. Brothers and sisters, I know how to live in humble circumstances. I know also how to live with abundance. In every circumstance and in all things, I have learned the secret of being well fed and of going hungry, of living in abundance, and of being in need. I can do all things in him who strengthens me. Still, it was kind of you to share in my distress. My God will fully supply whatever you need in accordance with his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father, glory forever and ever. Amen. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, o Lord. Jesus again in reply spoke to the chief priests and elders of the people in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be likened to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. He dispatched his servants to summon the invited guests to the feast, but they refused to come. A second time he sent other servants, saying, Tell those invited, Behold, I have prepared my banquet. My calves and fatted cattle are killed, and everything is ready. Come to the feast. Some ignored the invitation and went away, one to his farm, another to his business. The rest laid hold of his servants, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged and sent his troops, destroyed those murderers, and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, the feast is ready. But those who were invited were not worthy to come. Go out therefore into the main roads and invite to the feast whomever you find. The servants went out into the streets and gathered all they had found, bad and good alike. And the hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to meet the guests, he saw a man there not dressed in a wedding garment. The king said to him, my friend, how is it that you came in here without a wedding garment? But he was reduced to silence. Then the king said to his attendants, bind his hands and feet and cast him into the darkness outside where there will be wailing and grinding of teeth. Many are invited, but few are chosen. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. My friend, how is it that you came in here without a wedding garment? Like many scriptural passages, this one you just heard has been interpreted in many different ways, especially a more spiritual interpretation, certainly not so much literally. And it's been interpreted beautifully so. St. Gregory the Great, centuries ago, described that the Lord opened the banquet hall to the invited guests, and they responded, but that they were lacking something essential namely the virtue of charity. 
he connected the wedding garment with the virtue of supernatural charity. Faith may have opened the gate, but they lacked the proper garment. And so in describing the garment as that of love, he's making a very important point, asking us to reflect on how ready we are. He goes on to say the garment is woven of two threads, love of God and love of neighbor. And together they form the garment. Each of you who lives in the church, he wrote, and believes in God has already entered the wedding banquet. But the one who does not take care of the grace of charity is the one who's come without the wedding garment. Let him, while being a guest, who does not have this robe, be filled with anxiety and fear at the coming of the king. He will be thrown outside. So in this spiritual interpretation, St. Gregory is reminding you and me about the dual duty of love of God and love of neighbor. And as valid as this spiritual reading of the parable is, it's equally true there are also very practical questions surrounding what it means to be prepared for the banquet. In this case, the banquet of the Eucharist. And so I'd like to reflect for just a few minutes on that. Because I say this because, my brothers and sisters, customs and styles change over the centuries. I've gone down to our archives and looked at the clothing of the people a hundred years ago when this church opened. And it's amazing how much things have changed. And yet there is a timelessness that tr transcends all of this. And so the manner in which we approach the banquet of the Eucharist is important. And it's worthy of our reflection. Every day, every age in the church, the church tries to respond to the challenges of the time. I'm going to take you back briefly to the 13th century. It was a time in which some of the beautiful churches in Europe were being used for all sorts of things other than the Mass. So much so that an ecumenical council, among other things, wrote about it. It was the Second Council of Lyon, and they were marking, remarking that secular uses for the church are just not appropriate. They were being used for judicial inquiries, public speeches, parliaments, and so they forbade that. But in so doing, they wrote something very beautiful about the theology of why a church building is different. Let me read it to you. Holiness befits the house of the Lord. It is fitting that he whose abode has been established in peace should be worshiped in peace and with due reverence. Churches then should be entered humbly and devoutly. Behavior inside should be calm pleasing to God, bringing peace to the beholders. A source not only of instruction, but of mental refreshment. My friends in Christ, the liturgy is our sacred work. The word liturgy actually comes from a Greek word that means public duty or work. When we gather for the Eucharist, it's a very important work, a service, if you will, we come to the church for a sacred duty, our worship of God. And this demands of us a certain decorum that equals the dignity of the building. We don't treat this like any other building. And this also applies to us as priests, how we treat the Eucharist, how we treat the sacred vessels, how we prepare for Mass. We don't treat this, or we shouldn't, like it's just any other activity of the day. This is the most important thing we do on any given day. The lay faithful ought to be able to trust that priests will show due reverence for the sanctity of worship and that they will carefully guard the sacred vessels and objects from any chance of being profaned. 
The liturgical law of the church is clear. The person who is responsible for the church, that's me, is to take care of the key for the tabernacle. It's right there in canon law. We couldn't just walk off and leave the tabernacle key for fear that somebody could do something horrible. God's house must always and everywhere be treated differently than other buildings. That's the point. And it clearly is the spiritual point that St. Gregory was making about this passage. We will celebrate this coming week the anniversary of the dedication of the cathedral, which took place the formal consecration on October 14th, back in 1958, only after the church was substantially complete. That's why it took so many years after the church opened before it could be dedicated. And once the walls were dedicated and the sacred chrism was placed on the walls, this church was marked forever for sacred use and sacred use only. My brothers and sisters, it's good for us to reflect upon our own decorum, how we behave in church, how we prepare for church. I always pray for our young families. I can't imagine how difficult it is to get everybody up on a Sunday morning and dressed and ready for church. And I thank them for the care with which they endeavor to be here on time. That too is important. I know it can't be easy when you've got a million things going on and you're responsible for others. But every effort we make to dress appropriately, to behave in a manner befitting this church, all of this sends a message to God, this is your house and we want to honor it. The church, the house of God, is the privileged place of the real presence of Christ in the Blessed Sacrament. My brothers and sisters, God judges the heart. He doesn't judge us merely by appearance. We could be all dressed to the hilt and our heart could be far away from here. I get that. But let's try to do both. Let's try to prepare ourselves to approach with the proper wedding garments, especially the garments of love of God and love of neighbor. This is God's house and we are privileged to be able to worship him in spirit and in truth. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, consubstantial with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate to the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried, and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I confess one baptism with the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. We ask God to look upon us in mercy as we lift up our prayers for all those in need of God's abiding presence. For our Holy Father, Pope Francis, and all bishops in the church, May they imitate the Son of Man in leading the faithful to the gospel of life. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all serving in public office, may they seek to protect the lives of those whom others would forget, promoting life, liberty, and justice for all. 
Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For those nearing the end of life, especially those who are isolated and alone, may God strengthen their faith and comfort them through the loving support of family and friends. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all married couples who long for a child of their own, may they find comfort in the assurance of God's loving plan. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For a greater appreciation for the gift of reverence, by our actions and appearance, may we always treat the house of God with the dignity it deserves. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all who have died, especially those who helped build and restore this church, may they enter the eternal wedding banquet with the Lord. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, as we strive to serve you reverently in your holy temple, we offer these our humble prayers. We make them in faith and trust through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Cathedral Parish is dependent upon the financial support of her cherished parishioners and many welcome guests. On the Cathedral website, there is a button from which to donate electronically, and there is a QR code in the Parish Bulletin. Or you may place your offering in any of the four drop boxes located at the Selby and Dayton entrances. We thank you for your generosity. Pray, brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice at your hands for the praise and glory of his name, for our good and the good of all his holy church. Accept, O Lord, the prayers of your faithful with the sacrificial offerings, that through these acts of devotedness we may pass over to the glory of heaven. Through Christ our Lord. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is truly right and just our duty and our salvation always and everywhere to give you thanks. 
Lord, Holy Father, almighty and eternal God, through Christ our Lord. For by his birth he brought renewal to humanity's fallen state, and by his suffering canceled out our sins. By his rising from the dead, he has opened the way to eternal life, and by ascending to you, O Father, he has unlocked the gates of heaven. And so with the company of angels and saints, we sing the hymn of your praise as without end we acclaim. Sanctus, Sanctus, Sanctus Dominus, Deus Abbot, Penis und You are indeed holy, O Lord, and all you have created rightly gives you praise. For through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, by the power and working of the Holy Spirit, you give life to all things and make them holy. And you never cease to gather a people to yourself, so that from the rising of the sun to its setting, a pure sacrifice may be offered to your name. Therefore, O Lord, we humbly implore you by the same Spirit, Graciously make holy these gifts we have brought to you for consecration, that they may become the body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at whose command we celebrate these mysteries. For on the night he was betrayed, he himself took bread, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. We, we proclaim, proclaim your death, O Lord, and profess your resurrection until you come again. Therefore, O Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the saving passion of your Son, his wondrous resurrection and ascension into heaven, and as we look forward to his second coming, we offer you in thanksgiving this holy and living sacrifice. Look, we pray, upon the oblation of your church, and recognizing the sacrificial victim by whose death you will to reconcile us to yourself. Grant that we who are nourished by the body and blood of your Son and filled with this Holy Spirit may become one body, one spirit in Christ. May he make of us an eternal offering to you, so that we may obtain an inheritance with your elect, especially with the most blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with blessed Joseph, her spouse, with your blessed apostles and glorious martyrs, with St. Paul and with all the saints, on whose constant intercession in your presence we rely for unfailing help. May this sacrifice of our reconciliation, we pray, O Lord, advance the peace and salvation of all the world. 
be pleased to confirm in faith and charity your pilgrim church on earth with your servant Francis, our Pope, and Bernard, our Bishop, the order of bishops, all the clergy, and the entire people you have gained for your own. Listen graciously to the prayers of this family whom you have summoned before you. In your compassion, O merciful Father, gather to yourself all your children scattered throughout the world. To our departed brothers and sisters, and to all who were pleasing to you at their passing from this life, give kind admittance to your kingdom. There we hope to enjoy forever the fullness of your glory, through Christ our Lord, through whom you bestow on the world all that is good. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Amen. At the Savior's command, informed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace, I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And with your spirit. Lamb of God, you, you take, take away, away the, the sins, sins of the, the world. world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Grant us peace. Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. An act of spiritual communion. My Jesus, I believe that you are present in the most holy sacrament. I love you above all things, and I desire to receive you into my soul. Since I cannot at this moment receive you sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my heart. I embrace you as if you were already there, and unite myself wholly to you. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen. Let us pray.
We entreat your majesty most humbly, O Lord, that as you feed us with the nourishment which comes from the most holy body and blood of your Son, so you may make us sharers of his divine nature, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Just a couple of very brief announcements. We do ask you to uh, take the bulletins home with you. They're single-use bulletins. Also, if it's convenient uh, and you're able, when you leave, to simply leave the kneeler down, that will be a signal to our staff so they know which pews to sanitize. I don't want you to trip, but if it's something you could do, that would be helpful. Uh, and again, we do have the special mass for the dedication, the anniversary of the dedication on October 14th, the 7.30 a.m. mass. We will have organ and music. And so it's a beautiful way to celebrate uh, this beautiful building, a gift to us from generations past, uh, our duty now to preserve it. We will hand out the communion in the normal fashion after the end of Mass. There are three of us today, so please wait until the communion minister comes to your section. Those who do wish to receive on the tongue, that's perfectly fine. I would just ask that you wait to receive from me when I get to the center aisle. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go forth. The Mass is ended. Thanks be to God.